Hello, and welcome to Business Matters, the show about people behind businesses that help make Tacoma a great place to live and work. I'm your host, Mike Work, and on this episode, we'll check out Dolce C, a Sicilian bakery, cafe, and shop. Then Andrew Fry will share some thoughts about leaving work, because it's not as easy to do as it sounds. And today, my guest is Johnny Marth, who's the owner of Family Tree Care. Welcome, Johnny. Thanks for having me. You bet. So you are in the business of trees and all aspects of trees, trimming, pruning, removing ones that are problems, all kinds of things. Tell us about your business. Uh, well, what we do is uh, basically tree maintenance. So anything okay. to do with uh, maintaining a tree, mm -hmm. uh, hazard tree removal. So if you have a tree that uh, has a big hazard, maybe a rotten spot, decay, mm -hmm. or some fungus, or slowly starting to die, we do, uh, we do that kind of stuff. So. so if you're concerned about your tree and what's going on with it and what might happen if uh, it continues, call you and uh, you'll come check it out. So that's one thing. And we'll talk about the analysis component later, but you also do trimming? Trimming, yeah. So fruit tree pruning, mm -hmm. um, uh, hedge work, um, uh -huh. and uh, anything, any tree that we have in the Northwest, uh, how to maintain that tree uh -huh. and, uh, and preserve it so it can be there for a long time. So. Uh, most of us have trees on our properties, and uh, with trees come all kinds of concerns. So if there's a view issue, you can help with that? Absolutely, yeah, that's one of the funner jobs. Uh, vista pruning is what we call it. Vista pruning. Yeah. Or if you um, want more light on your lawn, or uh, your neighbor's blocking your view, all these kinds of things you can consult about. Right, absolutely, yep. But the, the work itself sounds fascinating. For example, uh, the, the trimming for views. You actually go climb up the tree, right? You're an expert in climbing. Correct. Yeah. 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 Is that fun? Oh yeah. That's uh, that's probably why I do what I do. Is no the, kidding. The opportunity to climb. Yeah. So you were telling me earlier that yeah, you did one of these jobs where you actually swung, climbed up to the top of a tree, swung to another. Is that you actually do that kind Correct. of stuff? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and that's to trim them for the view. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we're kind of painting a picture. Okay. So it's the it's the art, which is the funnest thing that we do. It's. Uh, kind of showcasing some people's views in these uh -huh. beautiful homes that have, uh, you know, these, these great vista, vista views. And so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what we do. You, uh, free the view and protect the trees. Correct. And keep them looking beautiful. Yep, yep. That's, that's really interesting. So um, tell me about the analysis part of what you do. Uh, you, I mean, this is not something anybody can do. You've gotten a lot of training, and you can go in and, uh, what are some of the tools that you have at your disposal? Um, well, it starts out uh, with the ISA certification, I guess. Okay, ISA uh, means? Uh, international Society of Arboriculture. Okay. And so that's a, an international um, committee or a, a group, and uh, they offer this certification. You, you have to have a certain amount of experience and or schooling, mm -hmm. and then you, you, know, you have to pass a test, and you get this credential. And uh, get, with all that training, you kind of learn um, how to assess trees and. Mm -hmm. Um, what to look for and how to identify risks and, mm -hmm. um, and how to properly maintain the tree. So what are some of the, the tools you use? I mean, I think about analyzing a tree, you might uh, pull down a leaf and analyze it somehow, but you do more than that. Do you do core sampling and the whole range of things? Um, well, I just got some training in uh, uh, tree risk assessment, and uh, so uh, I, we don't personally do any core sampling yet, mm -hmm. but uh, it's something that we're learning more about, and mm -hmm. I think it's going to probably become more uh, common. Uh, a lot of times you don't need to get that in depth of, with the assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do a visual assessment or you can actually ascend the tree um, and, and kind of visually inspect the tree that way. And so a lot of times I can figure out uh, how risky they are just by that. And I think the core sampling is a, is a step above that. So. And the roots, what about the root systems? Uh, the root systems, a lot of times if the roots are uh, damaged or they have some signs, uh, it'll be some fungal conks growing or mm -hmm. you kind of, uh, there are root excavations, which would be a, a top tier or tier three uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of more of a specialized uh, uh, training. And we don't, we don't actually get into that yet. Uh, maybe down the road in the future, um, you have to have special tools to do that. But there are companies that we'll, we'll work with and refer and, and get that done for the customer if they need. So. And, and uh, you do all kinds of analysis, though. There's a, a range of things you're able to tell your customers. Yeah, yeah. You, you can identify different diseases, mm -hmm. uh, give them ideas how to, how to treat it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, uh, trees are just uh, overgrown, and they just need to be a little TLC, and, mm -hmm. and that goes a long way. So, so if uh, I have trees, I know where to call, uh, and, uh, uh, because you, you have all this expertise. You've been doing it a long time. Yeah, about seven, 16 years now. 
up I've in been, the trees. I've been doing tree work, yeah. yeah. So um, w how do you get your business? You probably have word of mouth among residential owners, but um, do you have insurance companies, contractors, what? Um, well, lately, because of the storm damages uh, it, here in December, we were doing, uh, we get contacted from some general contractors mm -hmm. that get the, the calls that the trees have damaged a home and stuff like that. So uh, for us, that, that helps get us through the winter and, and the Christmas time uh, where it slows down. But uh, a lot of our work comes from uh, a little bit of advertising, say mm -hmm. on Yelp. Um, we're uh, in the local shopper, which goes to North Tacoma. But the, the main way we get our business is word of mouth and mm -hmm. uh, just doing a good job for our customers and asking them to spread the word. And, you know, we're a new business and we, we really want to grow and we want to uh, offer, you know, the best service in what we do to, to everybody out there. And so that's really how it's happening. It's, it's kind of organic. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty neat. So you mentioned storm damage. Um, and I think that might illustrate sort of the the depth and breadth of your skill, you actually get called when trees go through houses. Yeah. That must yeah. be something. Yeah. It's, uh, it's always a different uh, job and uh, you never know what you're going to get into. But I think uh, just the experience of climbing the trees and knowing how they react, uh, mm -hmm. it, uh, it p puts you in uh, at least as safe as it can be when you're doing that kind of risky work. So. And also your objective is to get the tree out without doing more damage. Correct. Yeah, that's the goal. So you got to get it out of there without uh, cost them more money. Yeah, I, I imagine that's tricky sometimes. It is, it is, yeah. Yeah, so uh, it, it just sounds like a really interesting line of business, always different, always doing different kinds of things. You also mentioned uh, uh, earlier a relationship that you have with a nursery. You want to Correct. talk about that? Yeah, Garden Sphere. Yeah. Um, so uh, they, uh, I, I went in one day and asked if they would uh, refer our business and they had asked if I could give them some customers that I've worked for. And, it just so happened that they work with some of the people that I've done some pruning for, and mm -hmm. so they have passed our, our name along to some of their customers that come in and ask if they know anybody that knows how to maintain their trees. And so that's been a neat, uh, I guess, uh, relationship. So we're getting work through local businesses like that. And what we do is we offer our customers that uh, are referred from Garden Sphere a, a gifts card so that they can go back and maybe buy another tree and, and plant one that maybe we had to take out that was, that was dying or whatnot. So it's kind of neat to just be a part of other, Tacoma, I guess. Yeah, support other local businesses as well as a, a clever way to sort of build your business. Right, right. Get so, the word out. That's great. So how did you get into this line of work? Um, well, I, uh, I started long ago. I just needed a job. Yeah. And I think I just fell in love with uh, being outside. And um, I, it, you can never learn everything. And so uh, I, I just fell into it and kept learning kept learning yeah developing those certifications but you worked for somebody else I did I did I worked for one company for over 10 years mm -hmm. and a couple other small companies before that um, before I started my own or our own business I have mm -hmm. a business partner as well mm -hmm. um, and so yeah so I I, uh, I think I was very patient and uh, I learned and as much as I could while I was at those businesses and uh, and then it was time to, to move on and, and do it myself what made you decide it was time uh, I just wanted to be home. I traveled a lot with the other business, uh -huh. and uh, being home was in important. In Tacoma. In Tacoma, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I felt like I could offer the business uh, a better business to mm -hmm. people, and uh, so I, th I thought I should do it. So, Was that a big leap for you? Huge, yeah. yeah. Why yeah. is that? Uh, well, I made decent money, mm -hmm. and so it was, uh, it was pretty scary. So it was risky. You were leaving the, the steady employment that paid well to go off into the unknown. Yeah, yeah, um, kind of jumping. Yeah, <laughs> but the startup isn't too steep in this line of work, right? What, what did you need to get going on your own? Well, we started out with just a pickup truck and a couple chainsaws, and mm -hmm. we'd work on the weekends. We, we, when we had our other jobs, my business partner and I, and so we. Oh, would, that's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And so we would, uh, and we wouldn't take any money from the jobs we do. We just kept saving our money and mm -hmm. investing and buying more equipment, and slowly uh, got ourselves a chipper. And it was a broke down chipper, but we put a lot <laughs> of money into it over time, and yeah. we got that thing up and running. And so then, what we would do is we would sell our work in advance, mm -hmm. and uh, even just one day's worth of work or two days, and we would go rent a truck here in Tacoma and uh, pick up our chipper and work all day until dark and then uh, take the truck back and, and then just continue to do that until we, we made enough money to buy our own truck and, and now we're, uh, we're up and running. So. And you have staff as well, you have a crew. We do, we do. How there's, many? There's five, five employees. Uh-huh, yep. that's great. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, you actually didn't make a big leap. You did a transition by starting on the weekends, building up some capital to invest back in the business, and at some point you knew, okay, it's time to go. Right, right. I guess the big leap was when you, uh, you knew you had to make your own money at the end of the yeah. day. There wasn't, uh, 
anybody out there uh, lining up the work for you. So. Right. And um, did you already have a good customer base started when you, you decided to go out on your own? I feel like I did. A small uh -huh. base, just yeah. from uh, friends and family. Mm -hmm. And so. How long ago was that? Uh, it was about three years ago when we first started out. Um, full time was be about uh, two years ago. So. So, so you're getting a stride going. And, yeah. And, yeah. And so from back then when you initially made that leap to now, um, how far have you progressed? What are you seeing? Well, I think in the industry it slows down in December. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody gets uh, caught up in everything that's going on, and so uh, I think uh, this year we're we're working right through Christmas, and so that's important for us. So our guys continue to get a paycheck, and um, so that feels good. Mm -hmm. I feel like we've uh, made steps and strides in that, and um, uh, yeah, I don't. I, and then uh, during the the um, sort of the from fall to early spring, you do a lot of pruning because that's when a lot of the trees, the, all, the fruit trees, uh, various maples, all kinds of trees need to be trimmed, right? Right, right. The trees are dormant, so that's the best time to do the pruning. So. And, uh, and I would imagine that a lot of people know that, so you get that business. And then during the summer, you have the views and the, and the other kinds of business picking up. Right, absolutely, yeah. And hazard trees year-round. Yep, year-round. Okay. Yeah. So what do you see next? Are you looking to the next point of expansion? or? Um, I think we want to keep our business kind of smaller, uh -huh. but uh, we'd, I, I, we'd really like to maybe get into doing some of the uh, city work, some parks, mm -hmm. or uh, recently I was at the library trying to offer our services to one of the local libraries just uh -huh. to maintain the beautiful oak trees that they have, yeah. uh, just so one day I can maybe walk down that road and say, hey, we did that years ago, and uh, we've maintained that tree for many, many years. and. So we're, so we're not looking to get big, but we just want to, uh, I guess, feed our families. <laughs> well, it's good to know we have people with businesses like you in Tacoma that are taking care of our trees, and uh, not just as a business, but also looking out to make sure that uh, the city remains beautiful, because trees are certainly a big part of what this area is Absolutely. about. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Well, this has been great. Thanks for being on the show today. Well, thanks for having me. You bet. I learned a lot about trees. Coming up on Tacoma Means Business, Andrew Fry will talk about Thinking about business 24-7. A business means a lot to the owner. Responsibilities, customers, profitability, supply, and trends, they're all part of the investment. On this edition of Tacoma Means Business, Andrew Fry says thinking about your company after quitting time is an ongoing challenge. Businesses are conducted not just when you're in the office, but also when you're thinking about that business, when you're getting closer to executing on it, and it is a state of mind. Anyway, I had one student who took a class of mine, Entrepreneurship and Technology, and during the course of that class, he put together a business plan. He was a, a junior at the time, but his business plan was very interesting, and he was on the way to getting a degree that would get him a good job in industry. So at the end of his senior year, he was ended up getting hired at a great company, Boeing, as an engineer. And during that period of time, he kept thinking about that company. So was he doing business? Well, he was thinking about that company. Did he execute on it? Well, he gave me a call and he wanted to say, I've been thinking more about that company. I wondered if you could help me out and listen to a few of the ideas I had. In embracing a mentor role whenever I can, I said, sure. We went and had coffee and he told me about his idea and I said, you know something? That's a pretty solid idea. I think that's something that you might want to look into, pursue, and see if there's a business model behind it. Well, it's actually a couple of years later when he calls me back and says, I think I'm ready to do this company, but I do have a, a little problem and I would like to discuss it with you. And I said, sure, tell you what, I'll buy you lunch. Well, he came to lunch with me and one of his new partners, someone that he decided to do this business with. And here was their problem. They both knew, knew a third party who wanted to be an investor in their company. They had no money, they had an idea, but they still needed to execute on their prototype. The problem was one of them trusted the investor and the other one felt he was being a little bit more like a used car salesman. He basically said, they approached him and said, we value our company at a million dollars. And his response was, well, I'll put in $25,000 for 10%, which brought the value of the company down. And they asked me what I thought. Well, I told them, I didn't think that $25,000 was an investment. I thought it was a gift. They had an idea. That's it. They had no capital. They needed to build a prototype. Here's someone willing to fund some of it 
at a 10% value. It wasn't, but three months later, I got another call and they said, we want to take you to lunch. I said, all right, that would be fine. And they explained to me what had occurred with this potential investor. He looked at their idea, he was interested in their idea, and he was willing to put some money in. Well, he did his due diligence and found that their prototype would actually cost about $175,000 to build. And so he went to someone he knew who detailed what the prototype would be like, came back to them and said, how about if I put in $175,000 for 25%? Well, that value of that company just went up quite a bit. What was very interesting was then after doing a little bit more uh, work on the, the company and the program, they had other interested parties who wanted to come in and all of a sudden they were looking at a $600,000 investment in a company that went from its now prototype into a launch. This is still a fairly young individual. So they asked me advice along the way and let me attach a little bit of advice to the trajectory of what they were doing. One of them was understand who your partners were. Trust them when you can and certainly verify what they're up to. But as soon as it got to that contract and that big investment of dollars, make certain that you're comfortable with the lawyers involved as well. They're dealing with someone with a lot more business savvy. So the question becomes, how do you feel about the lawyers that bring to the table and so on? Chances are they're great and they're being brought in because he understands it. Remember, he's interested in your company's success too. And now he's your partner. The last bit of advice that I gave to him was, for the last three years, you've been sort of imagining what it would be like to be CEO of this company. You have thought about all of the different pieces you need to put in place so that one day you could be the CEO of this company. I told them, go to bed tonight, go to sleep. And in the morning when you wake up, understand you are the CEO of this company. And you need to act that way and you need to operate that way and you need to have faith in yourself. Thanks, Andrew. For more ways to help grow your business, check out Tacoma's Community and Economic Development Program at TacomaMeansBusiness.com. When Business Matters returns, we visit a new cafe featuring a slice of Italy right here in South Sound in the spotlight. Today in the spotlight, we experience the tastes of Sicily here in Tacoma at Dolce C. I'm Stephen O'Shea. I'm Elisabetta O'Shea. Welcome to Dolce C. Elisabetta and Stephen are owners of Dolce C at the beautiful new Point Ruston development on the western edge of Tacoma's Ruston Way waterfront. They opened late last year to rave reviews. What else can I get for you? The O'Sheas wanted an authentic Italian name for their bakery and found one in Dolce C. When I had to decide what kind of name to put on my, on my bakery, I was thinking, I want to sell the message a lot of people. So dolce means sweet, and uh, sea means yes. So sweet, yes. <laughs> sweet is a major hallmark of the bakery, which features authentic Italian pastries. But Dolce C's business plan also features Italian meals, wines from Italy, even retail merchandise and artwork, also from Italy. The bakery's modeled after those Elisabetta grew up with in Sicily, a place locals go for good food, conversation, and a focal point of community activity. It's about the food, the universal language of food. So it's a, the one you can tell about your cultures, uh, about the food. So. Passion, along with traditional Italian culture, are key elements in Elisabetta's overall marketing strategy. Stephen takes care of the business side, while Elisabetta focuses on the look and feel of a genuine Italian bakery. Without Elisabetta, I think this place wouldn't be exactly the same. Um, it'd, be very, it'd be very hard to continue this concept without the, the hospitality that she brings to it, because um, that, that's her passion. What else can I get you guys? The O'Shea's make a point of ensuring everything from gelato to cannoli ingredients are from Italy. Details are an important element to their business. Even the espresso comes from Italian blends. It took a little bit of arm twisting to get her to, uh, to do some stuff. Uh, she, at first she didn't want any coffee that she couldn't find strictly in Sicily. She did, you know, because coffee is, is a culture around here, she did kind of bend a little bit on that, but she insisted on having a very good brand of coffee. Stephen and Elisabetta's hard work has already paid off. Many customers, especially those who've been to Sicily, have provided positive feedback about the look and feel of Dolce C. They, you know, they said really they could recognize when they walked in that it was just like uh, you know, places they've been in Sicily. 
Dolce C's layout and design is flush with Mediterranean charm. Walls are bright with color, shelving features Italian ceramics and merchandise, even tabletops and espresso cups feature handcrafted designs provided by friends back in Italy. They have painted all the ceramic high heavy here, all the tables, everything you see and ceramic that come from Sicily. Each of the main bakery cases are filled with pastries, house-made gelato, cookies, cakes and foods. No preservatives are used. Everything is made from scratch, so everything is made here and not in in my laboratory call. <laughs> the Dolce C staff come from a range of backgrounds and talents. Some employees are family members, others come from the local community. We have four, almost 14 people, just started one new one to, the, yesterday, so 14. And I have a seven in the, in the back of the house, so, so one me, my team, cooking and baking and uh, seven in the front for barista and a bartender. The culinary staff encountered an interesting challenge in keeping Elisabetta's recipes consistent with the cultural charm of Dolce C. They were all written in Italian. So to teach uh, the recipes to our pastry chefs, um, it takes quite a bit of work for her to, to, to translate that from Italian to English and then teach the recipe. So we, we at first were a little bit slow to get a good variety out just for that reason. The O'Shea's knew the waterfront location would serve well as their business's new home. The Point Rustin Complex provides a spectacular backdrop for the bakery. Once, once we came down to the Point Rustin area and we saw this location, that was the end of the search. Um, but we spent quite a bit of time looking, looking at different locations. Steven says he received plenty of support from the developer, something he valued as a new startup business. The developer here also saw our business plan and it decided um, that this would be a perfect fit for his, for his development. The old world charm of Italy is just down the street at Dolce C. This is the moment you want to be sit down, uh, talk to the person in front of you and enjoy a good pastry and a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's it for Business Matters. Join me next time for more insight into the Tacoma business scene. See you then.